Hey everybody, and welcome back to another edition of the Security Repo Podcast. Yet again, I am Dwayne, your co-host, and I'm joined by my other co-host, Kazar. How about that? This week, we have a very special guest that I met at CornCon 2024. Alexis Dedeker brings a fresh perspective to her OCO consultant role, where she uses the social engineering skills she acquired from her non-technical service industry background to deliver practical insights and technical expertise in network penetration and advanced social engineering assessments. Known for her unique approach, Alexis holds certifications including Security Plus, Pentest Plus, CRTO, and is a recipient of the Women of Cyber Academy Scholarship from the Sands Institute. Uh, she's currently re- obtaining her bachelor's and master's degrees in cybersecurity and IT at Western Governors University, and in her free time, she indulges in whiskey, riding motorcycles, and fantasy lore. I think we had a whole conversation just about whiskey on this, but that's <laughs> not why we're here. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. All right. Uh- very happy to chat with you today, Alexis. Um, we're speaking today earlier with Dwayne, and we're talking about how we stumbled into security. And that's actually a question I want to ask you. Can you maybe tell us how you stumbled into security? Oh, God. Um, so I actually come from zero technical background. Um, I was a bartender for 14 years of my life. And so that's, that's where the social engineering really comes into play. But I was a massive fan of the show Hackers and loved Angelina Jolie in that movie. So um, that's actually my my handle, I guess you would say, is B-side acid burn. So I literally just took a leap because I was like, this is a bunch of sketchy things you can do legally and get paid to do it. And I ended up becoming obsessed my my very first semester. I enrolled in school and then, um, yeah, subnetting, I knew that I loved it because I could enjoy subnetting. I think that was my, my key to get in. So, so I'm a little bit curious, like, so bartender to security that that's feels like quite a jump, but maybe not. If you think about what a bartender do, does you, you deal with the auth in and auth Z problem all the time. Like, are you allowed in? Are you allowed behind the bar? Are you allowed to go in that back room? Um, but was there any specific, like, aha moment where like, Hey, I could do this outside of, you know, watching hackers or, um, I think it was probably, I I think it was, honestly, I don't know. That's a good question. (laughs) As far as being before a school, I really didn't know that I could do it. I really honestly just took a dramatic leap um, right into school. Um, As far as my second week of internship, I had to do a vision call and um, actually got the um, employee's old password and new password all in front of all of my bosses nervously. And so that's when I was kind of like, all right, okay, I might, I might be cut out for this. So that was a good moment for me. How did school actually help you get into that uh, specific job? Did you like, do you feel like you could have just gone into security without any school training? Did your school training really help you? Can you walk us through that? I think that everybody can have their own path. I've seen that a lot. I researched what I thought my path should be via like YouTube videos. Um, I didn't know anyone in security. So that was like my main source of information. Um, I think that if you don't come from any kind of technical background, school is amazing. I learned all my fundamentals, um, all my basics in school. It was like drinking out of a fire hose. um, And uh, it was definitely, I felt very, very slow in the beginning. But now it all clicks, luckily, and I wouldn't be where I am today without those fundamentals, I think. So it's really up to you and where your confidence lies with those. And and how do internships play into that, in your opinion? Like, was it really indispensable for you to go through that? Absolutely. Um, Being in the job field is nothing like what we're learning in school at all. Um, I don't believe there's any real way to teach that in school. So the hands-on training that I learned when I started interning, I thought I was prepared. I was not. Um, You're not working with any of the tools that, you know, school, you are, but you aren't, you know, you're not running Nmap all day in labs. You're actually doing like real, you know, using real OCO tools and offensive tools and things that you've never heard of. So it, it absolutely is something that I would recommend to anybody who's who's new and wants to learn so that's the second time that term has come up today on on this conversation is oco Mm -hmm. what is oco oh man 
it's the fun, it's the um, offensive cyber operations. So we do the bad guy stuff. We get to have all the fun and uh, customers hire us and nicely allow us in their networks. And then we kind of go through and rip and roar and show them what could happen if, you know, an insider threat happened or, you know, a disgruntled employee, or if somebody were to actually breach internally or externally, how bad can it be? And how good are their alerting and monitoring, you know, uh, things they have in place in order to help save them from the worst of the worst. So is that just a fancy way of saying pen testing and red teaming? Yes, yes, yeah. So yeah, um, I'm so used to explaining it to people who don't know what those words mean. So yeah. Um, so yeah, I do penetration testing, red teaming, social engineering. Um, so a lot of that and then vulnerability assessments as well. You mentioned as you're, you were getting into this, the uh, thing that kind of drew you to it was you could do all this illegal feeling stuff, but you get away with it. Um, and you mentioned the story of getting their password. I'm, I'm curious if you could share that story. Like, how did you get about that password? And like, what, yeah. what was that if you took in there? So um, I, I'm in the Midwest um, and in the Midwest, we tend to be more terrible at social engineering as far as being victims, because we're more kind, I think, in general. Um, so I have a customer service voice and I can turn it on and off whenever I need to. Uh, that's simply from bartending. But basically there was an engagement and they wanted to try to get someone's credentials for the engagement to try to do some privilege escalation. And the guys aren't the best with phone calls or being social in general. So they were like, why don't we just throw the two week intern at it and see if she sinks or swims. So I called with a spoofed phone number from her boss's phone number. It looked like her boss was calling her. Um, in the beginning that just made sense. So when she picked up the phone, she said her boss's name, you know, we'll say it's Bob. She said, Hey Bob, what's up? What do you need? And I was like, Oh, you know, sorry, this is Anna. Um, I'm with the IT interns and I'm supposed to be calling around because there's been some, you know, some malicious activity going on in your account. So Bob wanted me to use his office and get this taken care of right away. So she was a little hesitant at first and you could feel her like getting quiet and suspicious. So when I see that happen, I always like to, you know, break the silence and make things less awkward. And I was like, you know, it's not a big deal. If you'd rather wait until he's in, I'm like, you know, I offered kind of an out if she wanted one, but, um, cause we do that also just for the customer's benefit as well. Um, but she was after that, she was pretty much down with it. She gave me her old password and said, yeah, change it to this new password. And she even logged into MFA and, and gave us the device code. So yeah. Um, it was brutal. She probably hates me for the rest of her life. Um, so if she hears this, I apologize. I'm sorry. Uh, she, she can't hate you too much. Um, you're doing her job. And, but yeah, you vished someone and you voice fished them for that and social engineered your way through. Uh, now, I do want to tie that back to like, that's not a skill most people can just learn. Like you say, they're like, you, let's be honest, in the technical world, social skills tend to come second after the technical skills in most of the cases. And that's what makes those social attacks so effective. Um, so would you say that your background really prepared you for that because that does feel like something, you know, you got to social engineer your way out of these situations when you work in service. Yeah. So in the service industry, I think anyone who's been in it knows that you sometimes need to sound genuine when you're not feeling so genuine. Um, so it was years of that, um, really kind of having to, you know, get my way through that and constantly being on show all the time. And then also I was a really bad kid and called myself out of school a lot. So I had had fishing practice before I knew what it was. So don't, don't, don't fast forward that you called yourself out of school. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like in high school, like when I didn't want to go, I would call in um, and pretend to be my mom and say that, you know, I had a doctor's point or something, whatever I thought of for that day. And um, it took them quite a long time to realize that that's not what my mom's voice sounds like. So it worked. How many times did you do it? Uh, probably like seven to 10 about, yeah, about that's pushing it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <I was> mad. <laughs> Being in high school at that time was not the cool thing to do. So, you know, I would have rather been doing other things. So. 
All right. Uh, speaking of doing other things, um, can you maybe, uh, you know, during your day-to-day -day job, I imagine you've got so many boring tasks that you have to do. Can you maybe tell us about the more fun tasks that you would like to be doing more often? Oh, gosh. Riding through people's networks. It's always, I guess it's always exciting because no network is ever the same. Um, even if you come into the same vulnerability scan, the same kind of, you know, all on prem or, you know, all on cloud, it, it doesn't matter. They're all different in their own way. So I think it's just like getting a Christmas gift under the tree and you don't know what's in there yet. So, you know, you slowly get to unwrap it. I think that that's the most exciting part. So, um, other than that, obviously, there's a lot of reporting that goes into it. But yeah, um, just kind of ripping and, and being in my zone and, and going through the network um, is a lot of fun, I think. So. Yeah, all, all right. You, you spoke about cloud, uh, cloud networks and cloud resources. And my personal expertise is in cloud. I have never worked with any you know, old school on-prem stuff. Um, What's the most fun story? What's the like the worst cloud setup you've ever encountered in, in, in your career? Honestly, I don't see a lot of them. So when I do see them, I love to see it because I just probably in this last year got into cloud testing and I love it. So when it's available, it's awesome. Um, I wouldn't, I don't have any particular idea, but I would just say that a lot of cloud, especially when it's hybrid. So when it's on-prem and there's on cloud, people don't realize that um, you can mess up the permissions within cloud and still have them right on-prem. So, and it's just more unknown. So there's a lot of things that go unnoticed and I've been able to take advantage of that. And there's a lot of really cool tools that have helped me do that as well, so. I imagine you are aware of what CSPM tools are, cloud security, posture management. Do they, in your opinion, help? Can they actually mitigate the risks of having a badly configured cloud setup? Um, I think, I think they can, but I think that there's a lot of networks and people in general who want things a certain way or need things a certain way. So until every part of their network is perfect to being secure. Um, it's hard to really cater to that all the time. Um, you know, I see it more with on-prem, you know, if people have legacy devices and things like that, um, you're always going to have cache credentials. That's not something that they can remediate right away. Um, so it, it really depends. Um, but I think they do. I think it's a good step. And I think it's also a good step that the providers are already having default settings that are helping them be more secure rather than open and, you know, just ready to be ransacked. So. So one thing I'm always curious about when I talk to pen testers is, is how worried are you about like hitting a honey pot or a honey trap when you get into these networks? Cause it, there's that old saying, uh, like, the defenders have to be right 100% of the time, but attackers only have to be right once. But somebody pointed out in a, from stage at one of the conferences as it recently that, no, they, they have to be right once to get in, and then they have to be perfect from then on out because otherwise they're going to run into the traps that we should be setting. Um, have you ever gotten like trapped in a honeypot or touched a honey token you shouldn't have touched? So I know, I know that some of our customers have them. Um, Generally, they're more mature customers where if I'm coming across the honeypot, um, I've either already heard about it from a coworker because I've clearly already had years of testing. But I, it is something that we think is there more than it actually is. Um, so when I find, you know, a certain account, uh, that just seems too obvious. Um, like I think I had a DA account called Homer Simpson that I was able to crack the password for. And um, it had never logged in in like three years. So I sat all day thinking this is a honeypot account <laughs> and it wasn't. But um, I think that I don't see it as often, at least with our customer set and at least on just kind of in and out penetration tests. Red teams, yes, we're very wary of that. Um, Cause with our red teams, we are looking to evade um, any kind of EDR, anything like that, detection of any kind. Um, so we will be very suspicious of pretty much anything we see. <laughs> so if you see a passwords.txt file, do you open it? I'm honestly mm. curious. About this. 
It depends on the client. It depends on my feel already of the engagement, I would say. Um, if they seem to have their stuff together, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to definitely look into everything I can before I choose to open that file. If I do choose that. So, yeah. Let's go back to EDRs for a second. You spoke about that earlier. Do they, have they really slowed you down in the past? Yes. Uh, yeah. So a lot of them will just by default kind of either take whatever account you've compromised and um, isolate it, or it will block my IP. That is more of the most annoying ones because <laughs> clearly then I can't do anything with, with any account. Um, so yeah, they can for sure. I would say the best ones that have stopped me have been uh, Cobalt Strike um, and Microsoft Defender, um, depending on the tier that they have and, and how good their alerting and monitoring settings are already. Um, yeah, it's really not fun getting a great account and then having it uh, isolated for 48 hours because you made one dumb move. So yeah, it depends. Like I said, when you get in there, you kind of get a feel of how their security posture is already and what you think you can and can't get away with. And then you slowly test those measures. So it comes with experience and time, I think. Do you find these EDRs on infrastructure servers as well, or are they mostly on workstations? Um, I would say if they, if a client does have them and their security stack is pretty tight, I see them pretty much everywhere. So servers, endpoint, um, and if they have, I've had clients that even have, you know, Microsoft uh, Cloud Defender. So um, if they're buying it, they're getting it for everything, I feel. Because um, if they don't, it generally doesn't work out. Um, and I f end up finding a way around it, um, whether that be through the server that doesn't have it or the endpoint that doesn't have it, what have you. Um, we have ways to kind of tell what EDRs might possibly be on that device or that server. So that really helps us kind of decide how to make the play. So I'm curious when you get into the network, is there anything you see that's like, oh, I'm going to pwn this. I, I got this from here on out. There's like a telltale that like, this is going to be an easy one. Yes. Um, yes. Unfor so right now, the, the hot thing is um, Active Directory uh, Certificate Services. Uh, Spectre Ops did a whole white pages on it, and it was one of the first things I read when I started interning, and I read every single page because it was so amazing to me. And it's one of those things where one of the first tools we run is a tool called Certify, which will look up any ADCS server that is available on the client's network, and if there's any of these escalation um, vulnerabilities. And some of them are as easy as you can request a certificate for the DA account, and it's game over. Um, so it can be that easy or it can be, you know, something a lot harder, but that's one of the first things where if I see escalation one, um, which is, um, from the Spectre Ops, uh, white pages, I'm instantly, I'm like, okay, cool. Now I can chill out for the rest of the day. Um, cause it's game over after that. So that means any account I want is, is mine. So. How much time do you spend researching new topics and trying to write um, blog posts or proper articles about that? Um, I, I'm i um, obsessed. I have a problem with learning too much. <laughs> so I'm constantly trying to learn new things, especially if there's gaps in our team. Um, so like right now, my thing is kind of malware development, uh, cloud testing and web ad testing. I'm really trying to span out there. But as far as writing blog posts, uh, I generally don't think to do it because I'm new to the industry and I don't realize that was a thing at first, but anytime, uh, I have a really cool attack or I use a tool that, um, normally wouldn't be used or ha I've seen being used. Um, I'll do a blog post for pro circular so that they can get it out there. Um, so that our customers not only know, but anybody new coming in can see that, you know, we're doing some cool stuff and. We're having fun while we do it. So definitely we're huge fans of being lifelong learners around here. Uh, security changes feels like every day there's something new to new to um, take care of or new to learn about and read about. Um, but that leads to another question because getting into it, and I know a lot of folks that went down the path of like, yes, I'm getting in because pen testing is the coolest thing. Uh, we all saw sneakers and said, yes, I want to do that. Uh, at least that was my impression or 
uh, impression of that movie. Like I, everybody should want to be a pen tester. Um, but now that you've done a lot of research, you you're getting your masters. Um, what does the future look like? Like, do you, is this something you like? You want to double down and you want to be like legendary pen tester the next Dave Kennedy, or you want to? What do you want to do? I I definitely um, think that I really want to just hone in my skills as it is. Um, it's my first year, and I think every engagement I learn. I take the advantage of, of seeing vulnerabilities or things I've never messed with before to really learn more. So I think right now my main goal is just to really hone in those skills and be able to give people the best results possible so that if I'm not educated in something and they go and get breached over that thing that I wasn't educated on, I can rest better at night knowing that I've learned you know, how to take care of those things. Um, but yeah, no, malware development, uh, red teaming, Things like that really, uh, I just want to get deeper and deeper and get a little bit more into um, evasion more, I think. Because right now it's kind of, I go in, I wreak havoc, and then I have to write a kind of mean report. So other than that, yeah. So you mean uh, evasion, like just establishing a beachhead, like that persistent? Um, yeah, yeah. So getting into like uh, C2 beacons, things like that, persistence, um, you know, doing kind of simulated ransomware. Uh, so that customers can be aware of how, when, and exactly what it feels like for that to happen so that they can be better prepared uh, with their policies, with their procedures, and how they would, you know, handle that. Because I think a lot of companies aren't prepared for that moment. And um, the best way to be prepared is to actually experience it, I think. All right. I've got a question for you. We hear about the importance of AI um, in security, how it's going to upend the established order and do all sort of crazy things. Do you have any actual war stories of Gen AI helping you in your day-to-day -day work? As far as like, I mean, we use it for a lot of automated scanning. Um, so it kind of takes the hard work out of that. A lot of pen testing will be automated um, at some point. So um, I think the only scary thing about that is, you know, job security and finding kind of your niche then to show that you can do more than what AI can do and that you have a mind to, you know, think like an attacker better than AI. Um, but yeah, unless using it to reword my reporting paragraphs, other than that, um, uh, I don't really, we don't really use it too often for anything else. Can you, you said that you would use Chad AI to do scans. Can you be more specific? Like, do you have a specific tool or like, do you just use Gen AI to write and map or whatever else command? Uh, if I ever, so I'll use it for, you know, a script on the go. So if say there's something that um, I've gathered a bunch of files that are password, you know, named files, and I don't have enough time to go through 500 files in the time that it would benefit the customer. Um, it can help me write a script that opens up every single exec, um, file and its extension, go through it and find any information that will be helpful to me. So things like that really help, you know, on the go, then you don't have to sit there for an hour writing, you know, a script in whatever language that, you know, you're choosing. It really helps cut the gaps of time for those types of things. Yeah, it makes sense. So basically, you know, just using it to um, increase your productivity, yeah. as do all engineers, actually, uh, I think at the moment, you're just using it to write small scripts, um, do some quick automations that increase your productivity and quality of life. Definitely. If anybody says they don't use it, I call them a liar. So. <laughs> Hey, uh, we're getting toward the end of the show here, and I did want to circle back around to one of the original topics we were talking about, and that is making that leap. Like you did, you were one of the successful, successful people that actually got up and did it. Uh, and it's something we hear all the time is like, how do I get started? I don't know how to get started. I don't know what to do. I'm intimidated by all of this world. Um, so what advice would you give? If someone feeling stuck in their current situation, they think security seems interesting, but man, I got no idea. What would you tell them? Um, I would say do your research. Um, definitely get on YouTube, um, talk to people out, you know, hit people up on LinkedIn, ask them, uh, 
you know, what, how they got where they did and listen to podcasts like this, you know, that was super helpful in helping me determine what kind of company, what size company and what position I wanted. Um, of course I went after the quote unquote rock star position, but I think that as long as you're motivated and you're hungry for it, you can get exactly what you want in this field. Um, no matter how you go about achieving that degree, certi certifications, things like that. Um, any way that you best learn and makes you an asset is best path for you. Brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant. All right. Well, then, honestly, Alexis, this has been brilliant chatting with you today. Now, before we end the show, we like to play a game with our guests because we want to really know who they are as security professionals. So we've got four questions for you. and I'll kick it off with the first one. It's usually what's your favorite command line tool, but I feel like you've got plenty of command line tools that you want to tell us about. So I'll ask you, what are your three favorite command line tools? Okay. Um, focus on security, of course. Focus. Okay. So mostly it'll be for the offensive side. Um, I definitely use a lot of net exec, which is the new crack map exec, as they would say. It does a lot of active directory, um, you know, probing and things like that allows you to do pretty much, it's a one tool set basically for a network pen test. I love it. Uh, it's tried and true. Other than that, um, I really like Graph Runner, which is a cloud tool uh, that goes in. It's just flawless. And the output is, it's just on point. So um, props to Graph Runner. Um, and then not necessarily, okay, this is a good command line tool. I like using NTDS util because it is the one Microsoft tool that gets me um, the NTDS uh, file almost without fail every single time I've, I've needed to run it. So um, that one gets by people and I love it so much for being like a sneaky little snake in the grass. So, yeah. Yeah, fair enough. Looks like you really are a Windows buff. Is that yeah. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Um, another question for you. What was the best interview question you've been asked in the past? Oh, man. Bobby asked them, so I'm not sure. <laughs> um, probably just asking me why I wanted to do what I do, because um, I, I love um, expressing my passion and um, obsession with this field. I'm really lucky to be here and uh, to, to found what I'm meant to do. Um, so other than that, yeah, I don't really have any good interview questions. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, that rock solid. Um, I mean, everybody's got their favorite, favorite question. So, um, we've heard all sorts of answers on this, but that's, you know, rock solid one. It's a real one too, that you're probably going to get asked. It's an easy um, one to answer. Yeah. Don't have to study. Well, if, if it's truly what you're passionate about, then yeah, it's, it's, you don't have to think about it. Um, I was boiled down my entire use case to. Uh, help people figure stuff out. And that's, I'm very happy if I'm doing that. And that's kind of, it feels like home every time I, I get to do that in my professional life. All right, well, we've got two more for you. This is the classic segment on our show, best advice, worst advice. So we're gonna ask you first, what's the single best piece of advice you have ever heard about security or that you've given about security out there? And then we'll ask you about the bad advice. Um, I would say, so the best advice would be to remain humble um, and to just be wary of how you treat people in this industry because it's a very small community and respect goes a very long way as well as reputation. So I think that's the best advice I've ever been given as far as general for the security community. Worst advice um, would be I don't know. I just, I'm, I'm really big against gatekeeping. So if you want to be somebody who isn't primarily, you know, really well liked or respected, then keep gatekeeping because I don't think that helps anybody. And eventually we're going to figure out what you're doing. So, but uh, yeah, just Down. being educating people around you, I think is so essential and um, important and it really helps all of us grow. So. Absolutely. That is, yeah, I hate gatekeeping myself. Like, I stumbled backwards into security. I always tell everyone, and it's true, a very non traditional path from sales to DevRel to now I'm DevRel inside of sales. Uh, but along the way, 
people did help me a lot. Like everyone gave me that passionate advice. Like, Hey, this is how I think about it. And that helped me so much on my journey. Uh, well, we're here at the end. Thank you so much for being on the show. This has been amazing, hopefully inspirational for folks out there listening. And we can sh you can share this episode with your friends who are like on the fence, like maybe I should get into security. So uh, in case there are any final thoughts or parallels? Well, uh, I just would like to say that I'm, I was very happy to meet you today, Alexis. Um, I think that, uh, you know, all the things that you spoke about uh, were t terribly uh, on point. And to be honest, I would love to have you work uh, on, on my network. I, I think you, you would, you know, you would find quite a few fun things, but we should be, you know, would I find quite some honey solid. Pots? Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> you will definitely find honey pots, but I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, we do have a full disclosure. We work for Git Guardian. We do make honey tokens here. That is a thing we make. So uh, just just be aware. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll turn it over to you for the last words, uh, Alexis. Uh, is there anything you want to plug? Do you have any like blog post or podcast or anything else out there? Or talks coming up? Nothing really to know other than anybody is more than welcome to hit me up on LinkedIn if they ever have questions or about anything I have ever, ever written about or given talks on. I love sharing and getting people involved especially women, if you feel terrified, please come to me. I will help amp you up and make you the cyber goddess you were meant to be. So That is awesome. Let's all lift each other up and uh, we will definitely send people your way. We'll put that, your link to your LinkedIn in the show notes. So thanks again for being here. Yeah, thanks guys. See you, bye-bye. It just got even easier to keep secrets out of your Git history with the release of the Git Guardian VS Code extension. Developers have always been able to automatically catch plain text credentials before they're committed using GG Shield, the Git Guardian CLI, and installing a pre-commit Git hook. Now, through Git Guardian's VS Code extension, developers will know they've added a secret to a file when they save that file, before they even get to the Git add step. You can install from the official Visual Studio Marketplace or directly in VS Code through a quick search in the extensions menu. After enabling it, you'll need to authenticate, which you can do through the new Git Guardian extension icon that will appear in the sidebar. If you're already using GG Shield, there's no need to log in again. The bottom status bar will indicate when Git Guardian is ready to go. After setup, anytime a file is saved, Git Guardian will let you know if it contains a secret through a red alert icon down in the status bar. The extension also displays a summary of the issue in the Problems panel, right below the Editor region. Clicking on this information will open the relevant file to the problematic line in the Editor. Hovering over the code in question will display even more information, as well as give you the option to tell Git Guardian to ignore this result. Clicking on the Git Guardian extension icon will display customizable remediation messages, as well as other information. Install Git Guardian's VS Code extension and never accidentally commit a secret again.